Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. Professor Allison Bigelow is a literary scholar who studies Spanish colonial literatures at the University of Virginia. In 2016, she and University of Maryland Professor Ralph Bauer organized a conference called Translation and Transmission in the Early Americas. The conference brought together scholars from across many different disciplines in order to exchange ideas about how different peoples across the early Americas translated and transmitted ideas, and to discuss how they as scholars should translate and transmit those early American ideas in their articles, books, and classrooms. Allison took some time to tell me about her conference, why it was such a great experience, and how the Omohundro Institute helped make it possible. So we had the conference in June of 2016 with about 150 people working on Latin America, Spanish-speaking Latin America, Portuguese-speaking Latin America, Quechua, Aymara, Nahuatl, British North America, Wabanaki, Cherokee, Muskegee, Dutch-speaking North America, German-speaking Pennsylvania, French Imperial, everything. Something like the translation conference, it's focused around a central question, is really good for allowing us to see where we overlap and diverge in our fields. So I am a literary scholar, and I would not have realized how much my work right now is overlapping with art historians if we had not been at a conference like that. Normally, our conferences are organized by our disciplines. So I show up at literary conferences, and they show up at art history conferences, and we often don't speak to each other in a way that's productive. And so a conference like this that's really organized around a question that we all share is really good for helping see things like how we're all working on different aspects of the Codex Mendoza or or how different approaches to the study of literacy and the concept of what it means to read and write and paint in the colonial period is really driving a lot of different research projects. By leveraging the Omohundro Institute's in-house expertise in terms of technology infrastructure and how to organize a program, Ralph and I could then focus on little things like making sure that we had two panels on German pietism and we wanted to make sure that they were not at the same time so that you know, people who were interested in that could go to both panels. As the Omohundro Institute took care of the big stuff, Ralph and I could then really focus on the details. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Welcome to episode 110 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. History tells us who we are and how we came to be who we are. Its study tells us about people, how they lived and how they interacted with one another. Like history, genealogy studies people. It's a field of study that can tell us who we are in a more exact sense by showing us how our ancestral lines connect from one generation to the next. The Doing History series has allowed us to explore how historians know what they know about the past by investigating how they research and interpret history. But can we use the historian's process and borrow from all those tips and tricks our guests have shared with us about how they work to investigate our personal pasts? Today, we investigate the world of professional genealogy, a field of study that also explores people of the past and does so with the goal of providing an exact lineage of how someone in the present relates to someone in the past one generation at a time. Our guest for this exploration is Joshua Taylor, the president of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society and a professional genealogist. During our exploration, Josh reveals information about professional genealogists and their research process, where genealogists look for information and the digital resources they use, and the role DNA plays in genealogical research. Are you ready to enter the world of professional genealogy? Let's go meet our guest genealogist. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is the president of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. He's been a featured genealogist on the television program, Who Do You Think You Are? And he's presently the host of the popular PBS television series, Genealogy Roadshow. Today, he joins us as part of our Doing History, How Historians Work series to explore the world of genealogy and how we can use genealogy to research our early American ancestors. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Joshua Taylor. Hey, thank you. It's good to be here. Josh, you're the president of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society and a professional genealogist. 
Would you tell us about the society and about the work that professional genealogists do? Absolutely. So the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society was founded in 1869. And so we're coming up on our 150th anniversary in a few years. And the organization is set up to help provide resources to anyone who's researching an ancestor from New York. So it could be someone from New York City, someone from Albany, someone from the western part of the state. And we try and help our members and basically anyone with an interest or a question help to tell the stories of their New York families. So as a professional genealogist, we work in census records and vital records and land records and any record that we can get our hands on that sort of puts an ancestor in a certain place in time is what we'll be looking at to try and compile that overall family narrative. We know that professional historians typically go to graduate school and earn either a master's degree or a PhD in history. What sort of training does someone need in order to become a professional genealogist? You know, a lot of professional genealogists are actually self-taught. Many become interested as a hobby and then decide to turn it into a profession. There are institutes and there are some courses like Boston University has a course, for example, and a certificate program set up. But a lot of genealogists literally are self-taught. They attend conferences and seminars and they get a lot of their experience sort of working in the records themselves. Now, your graduate training is in history. And as we said, you work as a professional genealogist. So would you tell us what makes the study of history and the study of genealogy different from each other? Such a good question (laughs) and really, really hard to answer because I feel like a lot of the time when I'm actually doing my genealogical research and I'm focusing on sort of a specific person and their family, I have to be developing the historical context behind where they're living and what's happening to them. And even the records that I'm using, I have to know a little bit about the history of the area before I know exactly where to go. So I would say that one difference is primarily the focus on specific families and specific individuals and the desire to sort of build out an entire tree. But I don't think that any genealogist could be successful successful without also researching history and becoming at least a sort of you know hobby historian of that particular area where they're researching her family. Okay, I think we're ready to take a deep dive into the world of genealogy. Say we want to start researching our family's past. Our goals are to find out who we are, where our family comes from, and whether our family has any links to early America. Where do we start, Josh? Where do genealogists start a new project? We always say in genealogy that you should start with sort of the present generation and work backwards. A lot of genealogists might pick up a family story that says, my ancestor owned a house that George Washington slept in during the revolution. And so they might want to start trying to prove that story. We work from the present and then back. Typically, we start with vital records and census records. You know, that gets us back to the 1790s in most cases. And then we pick up with town records, of land records, probate records, and, and other sort of church records and use those instances to try and build the tree sort of one generation at a time. Speaking of family trees, and this is something I've always wondered, if you're not a royal, how far back can someone trace their family tree? It really depends. You know, some of my early English lines that are not sort of connected at all through noble families, I've got them back to the early 1600s just because they happen to be part of a parish and they didn't move for many, many years. And so they're consistently within that same parish from step to step to step. That's a sort of worthy goal for a lot of people to reach. It's interesting, a lot of Americans who sort of look for early American research, they can get their family back to the 1600s. It's that bridge back to, you know, the UK or another sort of country that can be really hard to find. But I generally tell people that in most cases, 1600 is where you can get yourself to. Why is the bridge between North America and Europe hard for people to locate and research? It's one of those areas where we sort of have this misconception and genealogists have it quite often that, you know, someone would arrive and say they hopped off Boston and, you know, in 1635 and they went and registered their vital records right away and they went and kept all the things that we do today. And of course, that's not the case at all. And so there's a severe lack of records and people at that point, they knew where they were from and many didn't find a need to write it down somewhere as part of the historical record. And so it's lost. We have to see if we can discover it through, you know, different theories and looking at different patterns amongst families. If we left the United States and went to a different country to see if we could find that bridge to Europe, would we encounter any differences in how people research genealogy in that different country? Absolutely. There's differences in the sense of the accessibility of records. So, so many of records are available now online. We use sites like Ancestry and Family Search all the time to access some of these records. But there is certainly something to be said for going to a local county archive or the National Archives, for example, at Kew in the UK and pulling up collections that might have some early passenger lists or that might actually give you someone, for example, filing a power of attorney when they're going to head off into the colonies and they wanted to make sure that someone back home could settle their estate and sort of help them manage any of their businesses or their other transactions. So you see documents like that, though we're just seeing some of those come online. It's very, very necessary to still go on site in many cases. 
Historians almost always begin their research projects with questions. And you mentioned that genealogists start their research projects in the present and work their way backwards. Do questions play any role in genealogical research? A lot of folks might start with sort of one specific question, but it's the research process. And so you always want to know something else. You're always asking more questions. And so as I sort of work with people and as I work on my own family history, I'm trying to answer a series of questions as I'm working to build the tree. In fact, a lot of genealogists become overwhelmed very quickly because they want to ask 200 questions all at once because they have all these ancestors. And so they can learn a lot from historians to ask sort of that specific question and then work to find the answer to it. You mentioned the word process. Is there a process for researching genealogy that we could follow when we research our own family's past? There's a couple of sort of written processes and standards that have been put together. There's an organization that's called the Board for Certification of Genealogists that produces standards for research. And there's a couple of sort of different things that they've put out that sort of help us to figure out exactly how to do research. One of it is called the GPS system. And basically, the idea behind it is that you're working to find sort of pieces of evidence and working to build together a case and put together a family. So the genealogical proof standard, it's part of 83 different points. (laughs) It's a very, very long process. But it is all about finding that process of you know, locating evidence, analyzing that evidence, looking for conflicting information, and then seeing if you can draw any conclusions based upon the evidence that you have in front of you. Historians use and analyze evidence in their work, too, and they typically find that evidence in libraries, archives, and specialized databases. Where do genealogists find the evidence that they're looking for? They're in the exact same places. Typically, when I'm in an archive, I usually will be sitting next to a historian. There might be a genealogist off the other side. They're using some of the exact same resources. They're, of course, looking in many cases for sources that have things like names and dates in them, but they use the same types of repositories. A lot of genealogists use a site like Ancestry.com that has digitized index records, but other genealogists head to archives. They head to courthouses, always looking for those original documents that will help to give them some of the pieces of the past. You mentioned Ancestry.com, which is a website I'm sure many of us have heard of. Are there other online resources that we can turn to before we make that expensive trip to a physical archive? There are. There are lots of other resources to turn to. One of the best resources besides Ancestry is a website called FamilySearch.org, which is operated by the Mormon Church. And Family Search is completely free, and it contains the beginning of digitizing you know, the two plus million rolls of microfilm that they have gathered from repositories across the world. And so, in some cases, that the records won't be indexed, but you can browse those digital images, you know, for free, page by page by page, and access a lot of original documentation. There's also a website. Called called My Heritage, which is very, very good for original records that are sort of outside of the U.S. and even inside the U.S. And then there's a British website called Find My Past that works quite heavily in sort of U.K. and Irish records, but also has a growing presence in the United States. The Mormons have more than two million reels of microfilm genealogical records. That sounds like a treasure trove of information. Can anyone use those records? I mean, will they lend those reels out to our local libraries? So they will allow it to be sent. In many cases, you can't actually get it, but you have to go to a family history center. So some of their satellite buildings they have all around the country, and you can actually go, and there's a fee, and they'll mail you the microphone that you can use on site there. That's pretty cool that the Mormons allow anyone to use their treasure trove of information, you know, at these local designated centers. It is. And, and, you know, what's great about it is that in some cases, they were microfilming in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And so you're looking at microfilm copies of records that might have been destroyed or might have been moved or difficult to locate. And so it's always a first stop for a lot of genealogists to check their catalog to see what they have before they make that trip and, you know, head all the way to that original county archive or that county courthouse. You could very well just order in a microfilm of all the land records or probate records, for example, that have been microfilmed. Yeah, I wonder if we could talk about records more specifically. Now, you mentioned that genealogists use many of the same records that historians go into the archives to find and that we can access many records just through websites. But what types of records are we looking for and at? One of the early American ancestors that I've traced is a Baptist minister in New Hampshire named Oliver Williams. And this is a case where, you know, we'd start looking through the vital records in New Hampshire that were compiled sort of on a town level. And we find that he dies there in the town of Grafton. And so the next type of record that we might head to would be a, a listing of cemeteries, because figuring out the birth and death dates and sort of who's buried next to whom within a cemetery is another resource that we would use. And from there, we would do sort of an extensive search across land transactions, so deeds and mortgages 
mortgages in the area because deeds oftentimes will give, you know, not only is it the purchase of a property, it's do they mention any specifics or are they buying it from a brother or does it mention property that I received from so-and-so? And we might also look at probate records because when someone, of course, passes away and if they had a will that was taken into court to be probated, the wills oftentimes will you know leave money to their daughter, Susan, and, you know, and then son, William. And that allows us to actually reconstruct a family based entirely upon a probate document. In fact, as a genealogist, I usually prefer when an ancestor dies without a will and they have to go through as the probate court and find all of the heirs because you normally get a more detailed look at the family tree at that moment when someone dies without a will. But you get you know all sorts of different records that are sort of based in the courthouse. Genealogists and historians are really like kindred spirits because we historians love it when people like John and Abigail Adams are separated for years because they have to write letters to each other. <laughs> yes, those of us who are lucky enough to have sort of family collections and letters and diaries are, we love it because we can really, really understand the family and understand the relationships, even sort of friends and associates beyond just those related by blood. Now, what happens when you don't have any letters or diaries or manuscripts or even probate records left behind? Because not everyone leaves a paper trail. So where do we look for information about people who left little to no written record? It's a difficult question to answer because it's so regionalized. But the one thing we do is we would do, I know, almost sort of a micro study of that specific area. So, for example, let's say if I have an ancestor who rents a farm in New York, I might look for any records of that landlord that might note sort of the relative that's actually paying rent. So that might be one thing that I could do. We try and figure out what are areas of their life where they might be recorded within a document. Is there a local store account, for example, that might list them sort of coming in every week or every month purchasing supplies? So we we try and figure out you know, what records might they actually be listed in if they didn't actually create the records themselves. So it's very much about understanding their sort of economic and their work as a businessman, and then also looking at other associates and other neighbors. So you know, a couple of cases that I worked on, there's nothing that this family ever left behind that they actually wrote. But everything that I know about them comes, you know, they luckily enough lived next to someone who kept a diary and talked about her neighbors because that's what you did. And so there's information about that family within someone else's written record. What about slaves? I have to imagine that societies like the New York Biographical and Genealogical Society have records that would allow us to get at the lives of slaves who wouldn't have left much of a written record behind. Absolutely. So there are a plethora of records actually that exist. We find a lot of records for slaves that you'll see within probate. So when someone passes away and they're distributing portions of the estate, you see them within land records as part of sales. And sometimes a specific farmer will actually keep an account book where you know, we've seen registers of births and sort of deaths of slaves within particular regions. And also it just depends on what that family's kept. But even a transactional record that keeps track of business or the production from a farm might include mention of those who are enslaved. In earlier episodes of the Doing History series, we've explored the collaborative nature of historical research and how historians rely on the research conducted by other historians. It seems like genealogists must also rely on the research of other genealogists to further their work on their family trees. Is this true? Do genealogists work collaboratively? And if so, how do you know the information that the family trees compiled by other genealogists contain accurate information? <laughs> Welcome to the genealogist's best and worst nightmare, <laughs> sort of all in one. Genealogists very often will refer back to work that's done before, especially in researching colonial America. I mean, the oldest genealogical society in the U.S. was founded in the 1840s and started in New England with folks actually documenting family trees and putting research together. And then New York sort of came along 20 years later and did the exact same thing. And many genealogists are very bad at citing their sources. No one tells you when you begin that you should write down where you found that from. No, no one sort of is holding your feet to the fire in that case. And so a lot of it is evaluating the compiled family tree and looking for, you know, are there repeated patterns of data that seems to be incorrect? Are there a lot of assumptions that are made? You know, does someone have a family tree with, you know, a person getting married at the age of eight because there's been a misconception somewhere, you know, misinterpreting a document. So you really have to almost judge the compiled family tree as its own type of source. And just as you would with any source, how accurate is it? You know, what are the things about the document that tell you, you know, this family tree has exact dates of baptism and an exact church, which means they probably access those records somewhere. Can I find a record of baptism for that church to verify that information? So we really have to analyze those compiled family trees piece by piece by piece before we're able to say whether it's something we can take and sort of cite and use for other resources or whether it's something that might give a couple of clues that we can't really rely on. Do we need to verify every step of the family trees created by other genealogists? Or is there some kind of tried and true method such as 
I'm going to pick three to five different generations, verify those entries, and if they all check out, this tree is good. So we're generally verifying every single step of the tree because it just depends upon how the tree was gathered. So there's a GEDCOM format, which basically transfers family tree data back and forth between two individuals. And so they'll take a portion of their tree from, you know, Travis in Texas and a portion of their tree from Josh in New York and combine it together and add their own information. So we have to verify each individual fact because we might not know where it comes from. And it's very possible that, you know, Travis's research was great and Josh's research was a little bit shady. So we can't take everything that's at face value there. What role does DNA play in constructing family trees? Because there are a lot of companies like Ancestry.com that sell these kits, and they say that they can trace our family trees right from our DNA. You know, DNA is really changing the way that genealogists interact with one another. It's generating an entire new generation, if you will, of genealogists, those who you know pay the fee and send in their sample. So the DNA will break down an analysis based upon sort of giant databases of where your family comes from. So it will tell you you're sort of 25% European and 20% of your ancestors came from Italy. The additional benefit from genealogists is when you combine the DNA test with someone who's actually done research, you begin to find ancestors that they might have in common. So many people think that DNA is, oh, I paid the 100 bucks and I'm done, right? It can tell me everything. Well, the DNA can tell me that me and someone else have a sort of shared or a common ancestor within maybe five or six generations. But then it's up to us to actually do the research to figure out who that person is. So while DNA can be very informative, it still requires that underpinning of solid research generation by generation to use it correctly and to verify a connection. So these DNA tests aren't telling you that you're related to George Washington. They're telling you that, well, there's this probability that you and these three other people on Ancestry.com share a common relation. And it seems like that relation came from France. Yes. Or what it could do is if you have your tree on Ancestry.com and let's say George Washington is in all three trees, then it might identify that the likely common ancestor that you share is George Washington. So and that end, it could give you that clue, but it all depends upon what type of data is behind the person's test. How safe are these tests? I mean, I worry that if I take this test and give this company my genetic information, they're going to log it into a database and that database could get hacked. Do we need to worry about our genetic information being stolen? It's a really good question and a completely legitimate concern, I think, that a lot of folks have. You know, these companies have put massive security efforts in place to ensure that that information is protected. I always recommend that folks read the terms and conditions very, very carefully before they do a DNA test to make sure that they understand exactly how that data might be used and also the protections behind that data. There's, you know, Ancestry, for example, is very, very good about sort of keeping your samples distinct and they keep it safe. I don't know personally of anyone that's had a bad experience, but I would, you know, spend some time reading the terms and conditions to make sure you understand exactly what's happening with your DNA sample and especially how it can be used. Okay, so we've explored where to start our research, how we need to verify the data of previous genealogical research, and the wonders and potential pitfalls of genealogy by DNA. Let's now turn to objectivity. Do genealogists need to be objective when they conduct their research? You know, the best type of genealogist is one that can be very, very objective. And sometimes when you're just starting out in genealogy and your question is, I'm trying to prove that George Washington slept in my ancestor's house during the war. Sometimes it's hard for a beginning genealogist to be as objective because we're looking for answers to that question. We're not simply looking for what was my ancestor doing during the war that might answer that larger question. And so I think that the more objective genealogists can be, the more productive they are. And certainly a professional genealogist try to be incredibly objective when looking at sources because, you know, even a marriage record could prove certain things, but what does it actually tell you? You know, that it might have the name of a father that was written in, well, was the father actually there? Is that information correct? So we try and be as objective as possible and not jump to any conclusions. We know that when historians research the past, they have the goal of answering their questions. And it sounds like genealogists have a very similar goal. But historians also hope that they're going to publish books and articles or put together a museum exhibit when they're finished their research. What final goals do genealogists have? What type of final publication or products do they hope that they're going to create from their research? So a lot of genealogists want to actually publish a book on their family. So they might be tracing all of their ancestors or they might be doing a study where they want to trace the descendants of a particular ancestor. So publication is absolutely a goal for many genealogists. Others have a goal to publish an article sort of in one of the scholarly genealogical publications that the quarterlies that come out that sort of have that vigorous practice for research. And then there are others that do it uh, simply so that they can figure out who they're related to and then they just want to share it with family 
family members. You know, most of us have that great aunt Martha or, or whoever she is that sort of has all the family genealogy and they want to gather and make sure that they can share it somehow on a giant tree. So there's a lot of folks that love to produce giant wall charts of their ancestry so they can have that as a conversation piece and make sure that knowledge isn't lost. What do these family history books and quarterly articles look like? Do genealogical publications have a narrative style or are they just lists of names with vital statistics of the people within them? It really depends. Most of the quarterlies will combine a biographical sort of version as well as the genealogical version. So it might be a brief life sketch of someone. So it will give the information about where they were born, but then it will include biographical details, things about military service and you know where they live, property they might have owned. And then it will list the children. And then actually those that list sort of multiple families, there's usually a numbering system involved. And so you might have a shorter sort of biographical note or family sketch for a child, but sort of main generations, you might have a paragraph you might have 50 pages. It depends upon how in-depth the person has actually been when they've published that research. Have you ever become stuck while conducting your research, Josh? And if so, would you tell us about a time you've been stuck and how you worked your way around the fact that you couldn't find the information you were looking for? You know, I get stuck all the time. (laughs) It's a matter of my ancestors were not always the best record keepers, and they weren't always sort of top of the record chain in that sense. They didn't appear in everything. Oliver Williams, who I talked about earlier, was a great example. I wanted to know his parents, and all I knew is that he showed up in New Hampshire in the 1780s. And so it seems simple now when I go back and realize that I actually used history to break through that brick wall because I looked at it and said, okay, he's a Baptist minister. He's showing up in New Hampshire in the 1780s. Where is he likely from? And I had looked in Massachusetts and then realized I shouldn't have been looking there. I should have been looking in Rhode Island because of the affiliation there with the Baptist Church. And sure enough, that's where he's from. His birth's recorded there. So in many cases, genealogists can break through brick walls by applying history to their research and understanding the broader context and trying to remove the person from the question and really look at it at a broader perspective. You know, who were the early settlers in New Hampshire in the 1780s and where were they coming from versus what about just my specific ancestor? So would your advice to a newbie genealogist be to start with the present Work your way back through your family lines. And when you get to an ancestor who lived at a time and place you're unfamiliar with, stop and read a few history books about that time and place. Absolutely. I mean, I always recommend that you read the historical studies of a particular area, read the local history to sort of see what's been written about the town and try and understand the place and the time your ancestors are living as much as you're trying to understand sort of who they are and their birth and marriage and death dates and their relationships. The two really go hand in hand. It sounds like knowing the historical context of when your ancestors lived helped you research your ancestors. Like you're knowing the history of the Baptists and where people migrated to New Hampshire from helped you think like, yeah, I should be looking in Rhode Island and not New Hampshire for the family records I seek. Besides getting ideas about where you might find records to trace your family tree, are there any other benefits to knowing the historical context of the generations of your family tree? I think it really enriches the concept of sort of family history and genealogy. We talked before about publishing and, you know, it's true. A lot of genealogists will publish a book that's full of names and dates. And that's that. When you start to add in that historical context, you begin to be able to tell the story, understanding what was happening during a particular moment in history and the fact that your ancestor was a part of it. It can lead to additional sources because you realize, oh, I should check that and I should check that. But it also helps you to fill in the gaps between someone's, you know, marriage and death, for example. You might have a birth of a couple of children, but that's, you know, 50 50, 60 years to account for in someone's life in some cases. And so how do you tell that story? Well, you tell it through what's happening around them, the environment they lived in. That's one you know, absolute benefit that you can get by understanding that context. Yeah, I suppose it is. Because then you not only know who you're related to, but also a bit about the times and circumstances that those ancestors lived in. It's almost like knowing the historical context of your ancestors' lives makes them come more alive. Yeah. You know, I've always said I am not as fascinated by the names and the dates anymore. I'm much more fascinated by the stories. And, you know, what did King Philip's War mean to my ancestor? The fact that he served in it, okay, what did that really mean? <laughs> you know, what did that mean in the context? What did it mean, you know, for him to leave home and travel? All of those questions that you ask yourself, you can really learn a lot by understanding that particular event. Do you have any tips or advice for how to locate records or how to conduct research for those of us who might be interested in starting an investigation into our ancestry? 
You know, the best place to start, honestly, is with the U.S. Census, and that's online at all of the sites I mentioned. So it's at Ancestry, it's at Family Search for Free, to Find My Path, to My Heritage. And the census, the most recent year available is 1940, and then it goes back every 10 years. And so you can literally trace a family from the 1940s back sort of decade by decade by decade. Now, once you get to 1850, the census does not include every name of the household. 1840 and back to 1790 just have sort of marks. They have the head of the household, and then they have marks based upon the age and the gender of someone in the house. So it gets a little bit more complicated, but it's really the census is a great place to start. The other place that's great to start is in gathering vital records for your family. Vital records don't always exist everywhere, you know, all the way back to the beginning of a particular area. So you might find that you can only get them back to the 1880s or so, but it still is good to gather that information and see what other details you can find. The next thing that I recommend is talk to your relatives and your family, particularly those who are sort of well-connected and ask them the same question different ways and then make sure that you ask sort of other relatives for their version of the story and gather that information because we too quickly, I mean, I started genealogy quite young and I still wasn't able to talk to all my relatives and I lost out on a lot of the stories and a lot of the information because I just didn't know to ask. So make sure that you're not skipping through those living relatives that can give you great pieces of information. Answers and vital records from your living relatives would be helpful. Because if you go to the early census records, and I've seen this in my own research, you're kind of at the whim of the census taker in terms of surname spellings. Often, you have to wonder whether you're looking at the same families decade after decade just because the surname is always misspelled. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is where the analysis of that type of record comes into play. And so talking to a family member, and, and sometimes the family member might see something different. So I had ancestors that have first and middle names, and it was my great aunt that said, oh, well, he always went by his middle name. But in the census, he's under his first name. I never would have known it was the same person had I not had that type of information for my own family. Are there other common difficulties that genealogists run into on a regular basis that perhaps we should be aware of before we start our research? A couple of things. One, and you've identified it with the various name spellings. Our ancestors very rarely were the person sitting creating the record. They were either the person being asked to fill out the census form or being asked for information and someone else was actually handwriting the details and spelling things phonetically. So we always say in genealogy, spelling really never counts. It's all depending upon how you hear a particular name. Another real challenge that genealogists have are missing or destroyed records. So we talked about the census, but the 1890 census is largely destroyed, so it isn't available to us. It becomes a major, major gap in the records between 1880 and 1900. And so with that, the sort of lack of records, you know, the, the lack of early marriage records or birth records in New York, for example, is something that we run into all the time <laughs> here at the New York GNB because there just are not, you know, civil marriage records recorded in 1840 and 1850. So that's one thing that really, really trips up a lot of genealogists. By chance, does the problem of not having early marriage records in New York relate to the problem that I faced when I researched my dissertation in Albany? The fact that the New York State Capitol fire in 1911 ate lots of records? Yes. <laughs> and genealogists will often try and sort of recreate records or find different substitutes for missing records, like, you know, the state census records that were lost in that fire. Copies that were available at a local level have been identified and sort of digitized or at least within finding aids so we know where there's a surviving copy of the census. But yeah, that 1911 uh, Capitol fire wreaked havoc for historians and genealogists. Yeah. Tell me about it. It's kind of like a rite of passage, though, for anyone who studies New York state history. You go up to the state library and archives and ask for records, and they hand you a box of charred material. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Now that we've addressed one of the many hiccups one might experience while researching their family tree in New York, are there any other states or localities that have famous instances where a sizable chunk of their records have been destroyed? There are certainly several counties in the southern states that during the Civil War, as courthouses were destroyed, literally, you'll find that land records don't start until sort of 1866 or 1870, even though they were recorded, but they were destroyed during the war. So just as, you know, we're always very worried as genealogists about record destruction within a courthouse or within this particular archive, there are areas in the southern states and, and even outside of the region where there's been a courthouse fire that's destroyed a long series of records that we simply can't replace. It seems like this is where consulting a local archive or a resource like the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society would be really helpful, because I have to believe that the people working there must be quite knowledgeable about how to find the same information by looking at other sources. It's one sort of resource that organizations like the New York GNB and even local genealogical societies offer. We call them the boots on the ground. And they understand that while there's been a particular fire here, here's the three other sources you can look at if you're trying to answer that particular type of a question. How collaborative are the different genealogical societies? 
Like here in Boston, we have the New England Historical and Genealogical Society. And in New York, there's your organization, the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. Would these two organizations or like organizations ever work together? So most organizations are pretty distinctive that they will absolutely partner on projects to work together. So, for example, in New York, we partner with the Central New York Technological Society. We have for a couple of years to do a New York State Family History Conference because we recognize that, you know, we might have expertise at a statewide level, but that very local sort of knowledge within Syracuse is something that the Central New York Society has. And so we partner on events. Very often we partner with different publications where we might make sure that, you know, we're running an article specifically about the card files in the sort of library in Buffalo, New York, because we want to make sure that people know how to access them and that they exist. And so we sort of invite a librarian there or someone familiar with the record set to actually write and talk and share about that collection. But there are societies that do sort of joint indexing projects and other things all the time. Okay, let's say someone lives in California and there's a local genealogical society there, but they know that most of their family hails from New York. Should they join their local genealogical society or should they just look to join the New York society because they know that their ancestors are from there? You know, I always recommend that you do both. So heading to a local society, and sometimes there is a misconception among genealogists that the local society only has records for that particular area. And the only way I'd want to join it is because I have ancestors in that area. And that isn't always true. They are a gathering point for education, for seminars, for publications. And it's very possible they have a special interest group that focuses on researching, you know, how do I research my New York ancestor if I'm living in California? So they can be great resources in that case. Before we move into the time warp, are there any questions about genealogical research or common issues that people ask you about all the time that I somehow missed? You know, you've been very thorough. <laughs> I think the point about DNA is important for everyone to remember, just that, you know, DNA is an amazing science and it's developing, it's getting better and better for us, but it isn't that be all and end all answer yet. It still takes that very, very thorough and methodological approach to research. I mean, genealogists oftentimes, I think, are accused of, you know, going in and grabbing the names and dates and then leaving. And actually, genealogy more and more today, it is the study of people, it's the study of sort of their families, but it's also that wider context, and that wider picture. And so I think there's a lot more storytelling happening in genealogy than there was, you know, even five or 10 years ago. Let's move into the time warp. Normally, this is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. However, as in many of our Doing History episodes, we're going to make our time machine available to you, Josh. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what will the future of genealogical research look like? What types of records are we creating today that will prove useful to future researchers? And what types of tools and access to records do you think that we can look forward to as we continue to advance into our digital age? So I think one thing that's going to be very interesting in 50 years or 100 years is when folks begin to use social media as an archive, as a research technique. We always lament the fact that you know, Facebook and Twitter, you get everyone's personal details and I really don't care what someone had for breakfast. As a genealogist, I really care what someone had for breakfast. So it might annoy me at the moment, but think about your great grandson, you know, discovering you and discovering what you were doing every day and all the pictures you're taking. You know, imagine sort of accessing Facebook as that archive to figure out who they were just with the way that we access the vast databases of censuses and family trees today. So that's absolutely going to change. And I think we're going to have more tools that have to do with indexing. So as we work to master the ability to automatically index handwriting. Right now, we have OCR that indexes sort of type. But if you can leverage that technology towards handwriting, you'll be able to provide a deeper level of access to a lot of historic records. So it means that my genealogical quest is going to be a matter of, you know, how do I sort through all these different tools and all these different sources rather than necessarily trying to figure out where they might be located because we know to index and identify so many of them. I can only imagine what my great nieces and great nephews are going to find when they access my social media accounts. They're going to find that I was obsessed with history in the Red Sox and that I love my dogs. <laughs> And, you know, we try and find those details with genealogists all the time. I mean, I would love to know what my, you know, great, great, great grandfather did on a weekend. You know, what did he consider to be a fun Friday night? I would love to have that detail. And we're leaving those records for future generations within our social media. So it's going to be fun to see what our descendants will discover about us. Yeah. And they're also going to find what made us frustrated. I mean, when was the last time you went to the airport and you had a flight delayed and didn't tweet about it? 
<laughs> That's very, very true. And the fact that all of our banking and all of our travel is electronic, I mean, they're going to be able to figure out where we went and where we were going and how much we paid for our dinner and what we have for dinner. I mean, th- those are our details that are sort of a math now. Just imagine that type of an archive. Before we conclude, would you tell us what aspect of genealogy you're researching now? And perhaps you could also tell us whether Genealogy Roadshow or the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society has any special episodes or events coming up. I actually am right now I'm tracing a circus performer in the 1840s who was born in Illinois and died in Bombay, India. And I am fascinated by this person. I decided to turn it into a biography, but he literally traveled around the world. And so that's my sort of personal, you know, after five or six at night on the weekend project that I'm working on. The things that are coming up at the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, we have a series of events happening next year. So we're doing a family history writing workshop here in March where we're actually going to do some hands-on help with writing family history. And then we're doing a guided research tour to New York City in March as well, and also to the State Archives and State Library in Albany, where professional genealogists come and you can consult and sort of work one-on-one with whatever research problem you're looking at, and we'll help guide you through a repository and see you know, what we can do and what brick walls we can help you to solve at that point. So there's a lot of fun events coming up at the New York GNB. Is there anything coming up for Genealogy Rojo? You know, Genealogy Roadshow, we are waiting to hear word on our next season. So we're kind of in a hiatus right now and taking a bit of a break, but we're still answering questions when they come in via email that the people sort of watch an episode and they have a question. We're always happy to see how we can help. And speaking of questions, where should we look for more information about you and how we can contact you if we still have some questions about how to research our family's past? So the best way to contact me actually is through the New York Genealogy and Biographical Society. So our URL is newyorkfamilyhistory.org, and you can visit the site there and, and feel free to contact us and a member of the team here and myself can get back to you. If your family is sort of from other areas of the country or the world, my best recommendation is honestly find a local genealogical society and ask them for help. They're usually staffed with wonderful volunteers that know those details that you need. So you can contact myself and you can contact the New York GNB, but also don't underestimate the power of your local Genealogical Society and how they can help. Joshua Taylor, thank you for opening the world of professional genealogy to us and for showing us how we could research our early American past. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. It's been a lot of fun. The fields of genealogy and history are distinct, and yet they're also intertwined. Historians study the past to better explain the present. They're interested in exploring the ways that humans and their societies have changed and stayed the same over time. Genealogists are also interested in studying the past. They're interested in investigating how specific people in the present connect with specific people in the past. Both genealogists and historians consult historical sources to learn more about their research subjects. And as Josh revealed, genealogists are often interested in exploring these sources like a historian, because like historians, genealogists are interested in studying history too. As genealogists research one line of descent to the next, they often wonder about the people within a given generation. Why did they marry each other? Why did they move from one place to the next? And how and why did they choose their occupation? Their interest in the histories of the people and families they research causes many genealogists to borrow from the historian's toolkit so that they can take a wider view of the generation they're studying and a closer look at the historical sources they're reading. Exploring the past with the knowledge of what's going on in any given time or place allows genealogists to see the larger period in which a person lived and what different historical sources can tell them about someone's life. Likewise, many historians also study genealogy in order to focus their view of the past. And in next month's Doing History episode, we'll explore the role genealogy plays in historical research. You can find more information about Josh, the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, plus notes and links for all the resources we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 110. The Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture recognizes that studying the past is a collaborative effort, which is why they sponsor events and conferences. Conferences provide opportunities and spaces for scholars to get together to exchange ideas and information. However, as we discovered from Allison Bigelow, Trying to organize a conference across different disciplines, such as history, art, music, language, and literature, can be really difficult. This is why the Omohundro Institute has developed expertise in infrastructure in conference organization, to make it easier for scholars like Allison to organize events that facilitate collective and dedicated conversations. Conversations 
that ultimately lead to new realizations and more information about the early American past. To discover more about the Omohundro Institute and its calendar of future conferences, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI. And if you're a scholar of early American history and culture, you'll definitely want to check out the OI to discover more about how they can help you organize your next scholarly event. Finally, have you researched your family's genealogy? Technically, this is something I'm supposed to do for my family. It's a job my great aunt passed on to me by making me the keeper of our old family Bible. But I haven't been doing my inherited job because honestly, I'm a bit afraid that genealogy might be addicting. What is your experience, Ben? Send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.